Hello and welcome to the first of a series of pre-recorded lectures that I'm going to be giving on various aspects of prose, specifically of uh, short fiction. And today we're going to be talking about setting. We're going to be covering um, in AP Lit four big major ideas, um, what we call big ideas, specifically pertaining to short fiction. And then we're going to go into actually reading specific examples of short fiction and dealing with how those themes and big ideas develop and appear. And we talked the other day about structure and narration, and now we're going to start to dive into setting. Uh, and don't worry, we're going to revisit all of these. We're going to be spending a lot more time. So if you feel like you haven't gotten quite enough of one of these, you're going to get plenty of practice on them. We've already talked about structure and narration, and now we're going to deal with another big component of how fiction is built, and that's through this idea of setting. And one way to start to think about this is to actually dive into setting in the form of actually looking at a painting. So what you want to do here is ask yourself a couple of questions. What am I looking at? What is happening here physically? What kinds of buildings am I seeing? What kinds of structures can I actually extrapolate from the buildings and structures when this time period is? Can I start to get a sense of mood? Can I start to get a sense of how I'm feeling emotionally based on what this painting is doing. Setting is essentially using this technique through literature to create a mood, to create an atmosphere. And obviously we can do that by directly saying that you should feel angry right now or you should feel sad right now, but we can also use setting to help drive some of this. This is, by the way, a painting called Nighthawks at the Diner. It's a very, very famous one. Uh, it's from the 1930s, incredibly evocative of a particular time period, film noir. You know, there we are looking at these four individuals in this diner. Uh, if you couldn't figure out what era it was, um, you could probably start to piece it together by looking at the fact that the men are wearing hats, right? Um, there's some cigarette smoking happening there, though the smoke is difficult to actually see. And you could even begin to figure out what time of day this was, right? This is clearly nighttime, right? Uh, maybe some of the mood that's evoked by this painting, loneliness, uh, sense of alienation, even though the characters are all together in one space, they are separated. And one of the characters has actually got its back to us. His back is directly to us. And so we have no idea who he is. So there could be a sense of mystery as well, too. Um, certainly this appears to be at night. And that might also be driving a sense of, um, again, a kind of loneliness, that sort of feeling that one gets in the early hours of the morning uh, when no one else is around and, and street activity has kind of vanished. For our intents and purposes, though, setting is easy to define. It is not just the physical location, but also the temporal, meaning the time, and also the social environment that we're looking at in a text. Now, that painting that we just looked at, we actually identified a number of those things. We said that it might be late at night or early in the morning. It's clearly in a city. And we also have a social environment that could potentially be America, um, especially since we have in that painting references to things like cigars and to coffee and that kind of diner experience, which is so classic American. Time, place, social environment is important. One thing that is I think really important to actually distinguish is that the time that the book was actually written or the text was written is not a part of the setting. So you might be reading, for instance, a piece of science fiction that was written in the 1950s, but is set in, let's say like 2010, that would be a futuristic setting. And that's important, but you wouldn't want to put the setting in the 1950s. Obviously, when something is written can massively influence the setting. For instance, think about books that were written during the Great Depression, a lot of Steinbeck's books like Of Mice and Men, or think about a book that was written after the Civil War, but is talking about 
pre-Civil War, like Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Great Gatsby is another example of this as well, too. It's a book that's written during the Jazz Age. And so it, it involves a lot of references to the Jazz Age. But setting doesn't necessarily mean when a book was written. It's more about when the book is actually set. Setting does a number of things. Um, first of all, it is what's establishing right off the bat the mood. Okay, Everybody knows that expression, it was a dark and stormy night. Right, That is the beginning of a, a novel that was written back in the 18th century that uh, is widely panned as being a terrible book, but that it was a dark and stormy night is such an evocative beginning because it sets this mood, right? Dark and stormy, well, what can you pull from that? Mysterious, mysterious um, maybe foreboding, dangerous, something bad is potentially gonna happen. Setting communicates so much. It also acts as a foreshadow as well, too, because oftentimes the setting of a story or the setting of a novel can actually begin to predict ahead of time what's going to happen, right? And that's really important. It can also be an incentive for characters to act. It can also allow characters to have realizations. And sometimes setting can also reveal their innermost nature. I'm going to play very quickly a clip for you right now from perhaps one of the most famous movies to have come out in the past 30 or some odd years, and that's Jurassic Park. And this was a movie that I remember so vividly when this movie came out. I actually saw it in the theaters. That's how old I am. And I was completely blown away by the special effects. There had been nothing of this quality in terms of uh, CGI in any film yet. So this was completely terrifying. But there's also an important thing to remember that it wasn't just the computer graphics that were terrifying. It was the way that the story was told. And the setting communicates so much and adds so much to the overall tension of the particular moment that we're about to watch that it's really crucial to understanding just how vital it is.
All right. So as you can see there from that incredibly terrifying clip, at least it was terrifying for me when I was in the theater, um, that we've got a serious, I'm trying to go back on my settings. Sorry about that. We've got a serious, uh, setting situation here that we could probably spend hours talking about. I was jotting down some notes while I was watching that again. And what I wrote down was it's dark and stormy, right? So we've got a dark and stormy night, but that dark and storminess just adds to the terror of the moment because you can only see so far. The rain is kind of pinning you inside of a car. And my gosh, the car is such an amazing thing to begin talking about. Most of us feel incredibly safe inside of our cars, right? But cars can also become these traps. And in the case of this particular moment, the car is actually a trap. It's a claustrophobic trap. Those two kids are stuck inside of there. They can't go anywhere. They're literally pinned down. And so it's this balance between safety and claustrophobia. And interestingly enough, too, the car is also the thing that we use to move. And here it is. We're stuck inside the car that we can't move. You could even move this further out by saying that this is a giant confrontation between nature and technology and who makes technology man. And so at some level, this is a kind of conflict between man and nature. You could almost say that the setting is actually developing the conflict for us, right? So we've got the Tyrannosaurus Rex that's attacking the car, which is a symbol of human technology. Who's winning in this scene? Sure looks to me like nature's winning. The ground even opens up in that one moment and starts to swallow the kids as if the earth was actually eating them. And of course, the scene where the guy gets eaten while he's sitting on the toilet is another great example of nature versus man. This is you at your most vulnerable on the toilet, thinking that you're safe inside of a house and all of a sudden it's gone and there's a giant dinosaur that's about to eat you. So setting can communicate so much and all we need to do is oftentimes take the time to actually pay attention to what's going on in order to be able to figure out what actually is happening film is a great way to kind of tap into that but ultimately we're going to want to really spend a lot of time with text as well too so what can a setting do well the setting can do a number of things it's going to affect character action and motivation uh, think again about what we just watched. Those kids are trapped inside the car. They can't drive, so they're not going anywhere. And so that's going to affect what's going on with them. They just simply want to escape. It can also reveal people's true character, right? So if you are being attacked by a Tyrannosaurus Rex in this kind of setting, how do you react? How do you respond? Some people are going to respond one way. Some people respond others, right? great example of this is the movie Titanic, where everybody is reacting differently as the sink, excuse me, as the ship is sinking. Setting can also mirror the plot, meaning it actually is just simply kind of echoing what's happening. It's not necessarily telling us anything different. It's just simply reinforcing the plot and the direction of the story. But setting can also be a character, okay? And that's a really crucial thing. Even though it's a, um, oftentimes discussed as a major symbol, Really, if you think about Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, one of the characters in the story is by far the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River is so much a character and so much a presence in that story. It is the thing that Jim and Huck turn to again and again to find escape and relief. They get their uh, opportunity to get further and further away from society and civilization. For Jim, it's a route to escape. It is a place where everybody is equal, right? As opposed to when you're on land, suddenly all the different rules of society start to play. So setting can definitely be a kind of character. Also think about something like The Great Gatsby, where you have that green light at the end of the dock. That green light is part of the setting, but it also turns into so much more. It becomes evocative. It becomes a part of the thing that Gatsby actually uses as a way to get Daisy back, or at least to think that he gets Daisy back. And then finally, it also is setting atmosphere in the mood and can oftentimes illustrate some degree of irony as well, too, in a story. Let's talk about some of the specific aspects of setting, for instance, time, 
uh, things like actual atmosphere, mood, weather, stuff like that. We'll go into each one of these. Time is important because we want to know historically where we are. What is our period? Also, what time of the year it is, what time of the day or, or night it is. All of those things are actually easy to talk about and to apply to how a story is being told. Also understand that time settings can shift as well too. We talked just the other day on Wednesday about how structure and the narrative structure can include things like flashbacks. Well, we can also play around with time in terms of the setting. And so we can move back and forth in time. Gatsby is another great example of this. We shift back and forth. And so the setting actually changes as well too. Place is incredibly important as well too. And you really want to start thinking symbolically here. Like what do these things communicate to me, right? Think about low areas, for instance. And you'll notice, by the way, that there's a note here on the bottom of the screen that this is from a book called How to Read Lit Like a Professor. It's actually a book that I recommend you check out if you can, and it's how to read texts, fiction texts, as though you were a, literary, a literature professor. And one of the tricks is actually read setting as a kind of indicator of the atmosphere or the mood. And so if you've got a story that's set in low places, Oftentimes that is communicating, <coughs> excuse me, something unpleasant, right? Something that's not very good. Lowness, right? Think about, we talk about things being like really good. I feel really good right now. So I'm, my spirits are up. People say that, you know, they feel high, right? As opposed to feeling low or low spirited. If the physical landscape is low or high, that can also imply a lot. Swamps, for instance, right? Think about something like fog, which tends to hover around low areas, right? All of these things are evocative of kind of an unpleasant situation. I, you know, you might have grown up in a swampy area, but I guarantee you, most of us don't want or think about going to a swamp as a, as a vacation, right? Maybe if you're going to go like hunt crocodile or something like that, but generally speaking, swamps are not the kind of places that people typically want to find themselves. Um, and oftentimes they're associated with unpleasant stuff to say the least. Okay. So that would be a great example of, of perhaps looking at place as a driver of something. You could also think about the opposite. So if we have low areas, we're also going to have high areas and high areas are going to have the exact opposite reading than low areas. So if low areas about our unpleasantness or about low spirits, about fog, not being able to see clearly, then high settings, mountaintops, the tops of hills, give us the option and the ability to see far. Think about what accumulates on top of a mountain, snow. Snow is purity. Snow is clean, right? It gives you the opportunity to see far. If you've ever climbed to the top of, let's say like Mount Taylor, you know that you can see all the way up to Colorado on a clear day, right? But also there's some negative stuff associated with high areas. It's not always super pleasant. You're on top of a mountain, you're oftentimes isolated, you're by yourself. Those of you who know anything about mountain climbing know that once you get above a certain altitude, you enter what's called the death zone. And so, Sometimes settings can have this double meaning, even if it appears as though on the surface, it's very, very one dimensional. It actually might wind up being quite complicated and quite complex. And so setting can have those sorts of double meanings. So think about where we are. Are we on a mountaintop or are we in a swamp, right? Are we in a desert or are we in a jungle, right? Are we on the ocean? Right? Or are we on land? All of those are going to start to play into how the story is communicating to us as readers. And we want to think about how that setting might communicate to us a more complex thing like theme. Right? So if we think again about the Mississippi River as being this setting in which all these different things take place, how then does the river affect the theme of the story? And if the theme of the story is something like, I don't know, we all seek escape and we all try to run away from the thing that's holding us down, then the river becomes crucial to telling us how that theme works in the novel because it becomes the way in which Twain communicates that theme to us. 
And we'll talk more about that, and we'll talk more about practicing that. Let me give you another example as well, too. Now, I don't know whether or not people still read this at Monte. Once upon a time, Bless Me Ultima was read by nearly every 6th, 7th, and 8th grader in New Mexico. It's written by Rodolfo Anaya, who actually passed away this year. Uh, Anaya wrote this book in celebration of northern New Mexico. So it is all about uh, the place that we call home. And just the fact that we're from northern New Mexico doesn't necessarily mean that we get a pass on this. We really want to spend a little bit of time looking at the text to try to figure out what is he after in this. And so let's look at this for just a second. I'll read it. Ultima came to stay with us the summer I was almost seven. When she came, the beauty of the Llano unfolded before my eyes and the gurgling waters of the river sang to the hum of the turning earth. The magical time of childhood stood still and the pulse of the living earth pressed its mystery into my living blood. She took my hand and the silent magic powers she possessed made the beauty from the raw sun-baked Llano, the Green River Valley, and the blue bowl which was the white sun's home. My bare feet felt the throbbing earth and my body trembled with excitement. Time stood still and it shared with me all that had been and all that was to come. Now, I'm actually going to ask you guys to do a little exercise with this passage and I'll also include it in Schoology so that you actually have access to it as well. But it's an opportunity to, to take a piece of text and take apart how setting plays a role in it. And so that is going to, and those are actually the questions, but I'll write those down separately, but might as well talk about them right now. What do you notice? Why do you think it's important? And then talk a bit about perhaps some of the descriptions of specific things in the Yano. Okay, here's some other things to consider. Some of these, you know, are actually, you know, from a long time ago, but really still hold a lot of water. And this is actually where a lot of people say, oh my God, you're, you're overreading the text. You're, you're putting too much into it. Well, actually, that's what you want to do in this class. You want to overread your text. You want to be like a literature professor. And you want to spend a lot of time talking about what things might mean. A good example of this is the relationship between seasons and ages. Now, years ago, people began to associate different seasons with different ages of man, okay? And when I say man, by the way, I mean humans. I don't mean just men. And if you think about it, we all go through essentially four different seasons of our lives. We are children and we're young at the beginning of our lives. We move into kind of this full maturity where we are kind of at our most physically powerful. And then we slowly start to decline we move into middle age and then ultimately we become old and we will eventually perish, right? If you look at how the seasons work, they work in very similar way. Spring is essentially a analog or something we can compare to childhood and youth, right? We're sort of, everything's coming alive at that moment, right? Think about trees bursting with green at the beginning of the springtime. Everything's alive, right? It's a time of kind of um, innocence, if you will. And you'll notice as well, too, on this graphic that's in front of you, there's an emotional component as well to this. When we talk about spring, you can think about, you know, youth, freshness. Uh, you can even think about the romantic or sexual aspect of spring, right? When do most animals reproduce? Typically in the springtime, right? So this winds up being actually a fertility season. Summer, we associate with kind of the middle uh, in a way, but really summer is earlier in the year than most of us like to actually um, say. And that's because summer is associated with adulthood. You can think about it associated with kind of like passion and love. We are fully at our maturity at that point. Everything is in full blossom. Everything is kind of alive. The sun is at its uh, highest aspect in the sky and the days are long. But then we move into fall and fall typically can symbolize sort of the beginning of, if you will, the end, right? Middle age. Um, a lot of people refer to middle age as being that moment when you cross over one side of the roof to the other. So you go up, 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 
up and then all of a sudden you hit the top of the roof and then you start sliding down. But fall is when leaves begin to die and when everything begins to start to go dormant. And um, in a way, it's a kind of a decline, right? It's a necessary decline because everything has to go away in order for things to come back. And ultimately, fall is going to lead into winter. Winter is always an analog for a kind of death. Things are not alive. They are in a dormant state. And emotionally, winter can oftentimes be a kind of uh, a cold state, right? Um, where people are actually not uh, fully alive. It's the exact opposite of spring and summer. And of course, winter is the symbol of old age. As we get older, we start to get lots of snow in our hair. We start to get gray. Um, and eventually we all have to uh, unfortunately die. That's part of the sort of the script. And so this is one way of kind of thinking about the seasons in a different way. So if a story starts off in the spring and ends in the winter, might that possibly be a way of thinking about how the author is communicating to us this bigger theme about life, right? Or if a story starts in winter and then moves into spring, it could be a kind of way of talking about, um, thematically at least, talking about things coming alive things reawakening, uh, a kind of hope, if you will. You can also think about directions as well, too. Now, we live in New Mexico, and as a result, we have this really beautiful symbol called the Zia symbol that we uh, have adopted as our state flag and as kind of like our state symbol. And the Zia, of course, if you, as you know from your seventh grade uh, New Mexico history class, each direction of the Zia represents not just north, south, east, and west, but also represents different components, right? Different ideas. And uh, very traditionally in many indigenous cultures, the compass directions are very, very sacred and important. East is always referring to the same thing for the most, uh, which is where the sun comes up and the west is where the sun sets. And we'll say more about that in just a moment. But think about the directions as being uh, kind of not just a, a physical compass point, but perhaps a mental compass point, right? Um, if you think for a second about like somebody heading south, right? Yeah, if you think about that, and many times when characters go south, it's they're, they're literally running amok. They're moving into an area where no one is gonna track their whereabouts. Going west has traditionally meant seeking freedom in the United States, right? East is oftentimes associated with mystery. Going north is oftentimes getting lost. Also think about weather, okay? Weather is not necessarily the physical setting in the sense of like the land, but my God, weather is such a indicator of what's happening sometimes emotionally in a story. So back to the dark and stormy, right? Or it was a beautiful sunny day, you know? Um, you can also play around with weather in an ironic fashion, right? So um, we're going to read a story called The Lottery, which some of you might have read, but The Lottery basically takes place on a beautiful sunny day. Unfortunately, it's a really dark, terrifying story what better thing to do than to set a really terrifying story in the middle of broad daylight when you ex don't expect something bad to happen. But there are tons of people who've written uh, information about this. Rain, for instance, just think about the symbolism and the importance of rain, right? Rain, like we saw in Jurassic Park, as a plot device, it, it's trapping those characters. It's kind of literally bogging them down. It's also creating this mysterious and kind of murky atmosphere as well too. Rain falls on everybody, whether you're a good person or you're a bad person, whether you're a murderer or you're a victim, the rain falls on all of us. Rain is also cleansing, right? It's transformative, it's a restorative, it's a symbol of fertility. We await the monsoon rains every single year because we're expecting them to bring life and sustenance with them, right? And in terms of their actual, the symbolism of rain, which is a little bit different from the function of rain in a story, right? What rain might symbolize, think again, new life, restoration, right? That it is um, something that can both make you 
uh, alive, but at the same time can also kill you, right? You've all probably heard the expression, don't go out in the rain, you'll catch your death, you know, or put a hat on, use an umbrella. It also is a direct connection to spring, although here in New Mexico, obviously monsoon rains are at the end of the summer as well too, but spring rains, right? Think about those. And that's just rain. We could probably get into every single aspect of weather and talk about it, which we are, because we're going to talk a little bit about snow. So snow is another example of this. And we could probably do this with all of the various elements, just spend a little bit of time, jot them down on a piece of paper, and we can come up with some aspects. But snow is worth looking at because snow is so fascinating, right? It is... Um, like rain, both something that is um, positive and at the same time also negative. Interestingly enough, um, you know, snow is white, which means it's clean. But whiteness is also kind of a devoid of any sort of color. In fact, maybe even devoid of life. So it's stark. It's severe. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but snow will actually keep you warm. If you cut blocks of snow and make yourself an igloo or you dig a snow hole, because there's so much airspace in between each snowflake, it actually acts as an insulator. And so snow can actually keep you alive, which is kind of an interesting paradox. It's also a symbol of an inhospitable environment, right? Snow covered fields doesn't necessarily always sound great when you're starving to death and you're lost, but it can also be incredibly inviting. Who hasn't seen a pile of snow on the ground and wanted to jump in it and make a giant snow angel? or make a snowball and toss it at a friend, right? So it can be playful as well too, but snow can also come down in the form of an avalanche and suffocate you. Snow can become dirty with uh, environmental debris, you know, whether it's dust or grit from the road, it can become disgusting. And it also can be a kind of a unifier in a way as well too, because it is pure, it's white right? It is just a field of white for as far as you can see. Some other things to think about, fog, rainbows, right? And a lot of this, by the way, is kind of overkill. Um, but I really want you to begin thinking about like, why is this important? I mean, you may have never even noticed weather in stories that you've read before, but man, it's important. Um, I don't know if you all remember this, but when we read The Crucible, uh, we also watched parts of the crucible and there's a moment in the crucible where it's pouring rain. It's the courtroom scene, right? Where Abigail and John are along with uh, Elizabeth and they bring Elizabeth in to basically figure out if John uh, has actually been having an affair with Abigail and the two of them are standing facing and Elizabeth comes in and they ask Elizabeth if, um, she knows that her husband's been having an affair and she says no. And right before she says no, the sky is clear outside and a ray of sunshine passes across her face as though to illuminate her, to give her this moment of total spotlight, right? But it's that kind of little detail that oftentimes just goes right past us. Maybe we pick it up subconsciously, but in AP Lit, we really wanna dig into it and try to figure out why it's there. Every word that's on a page was chosen for a reason. And if it's chosen for a reason, it must serve a purpose. And our deal here is to figure out whether or not it serves a purpose that we can then talk about. Fog, of course, I feel foggy today. I'm in a fog, I'm under a fog. It's confusion, right? Um, it can also be something that you have to get through. Think about the fog on the Mississippi in Huckleberry Finn. It symbolizes this moment when Jim and Huck become separated from each other. Rainbows. Rainbows have so much symbolism uh, in so many different ways because they represent this kind of strange phenomenon. They're incredibly beautiful. They're also incredibly rare. And so a, a rainbow feels a bit like a gift, it's some kind of gift from the divine to human beings. It's a link between heaven and earth. And it also might symbolize some kind of stasis or balance between God, humanity, and nature. So some things to ask yourself about when we get into talking about setting, and these are some good ones, and we'll include these as stems for you to consider, but is there any significance to the time of the year or the time of day during which the events are taking place? 
you might actually say no. And if there is nothing significant about it, then maybe setting isn't worth talking about, but it might. And the question is, do you ask yourself this question, whether or not it's significant, you want to start getting into that habit. Is the location important? Does it have any kind of potential meaning? And this might be something where you actually have to go back and look again carefully at what the setting is. <clears throat> but you definitely want to consider setting in the first few sentences of whatever it is that you're reading so you can begin to start asking these questions. Also, is the weather, the climate, or the atmosphere important or relevant to understanding some deeper meanings? You know, maybe it's just a thunderstorm that's happening. Maybe it isn't a thunderstorm. Here's another great example of a rain moment, right? Remember in Gatsby, in The Great Gatsby, when Gatsby and Daisy are meeting again for the first time and they're meeting at Nick's house? It pours. It rains all morning long. It saturates everything. In fact, Gatsby goes outside at one point and walks around the house and gets soaking wet. And when he comes back in, he finally meets up with Daisy. And as the day progresses, it clears up. And you don't have to be a wizard to figure out that the weather is somehow reflecting something that's happening in the plot. As it clears up, Daisy and Gatsby get closer and closer and closer together. Also, things like lighting. Is the setting in warm light, harsh glare, partial shadow, gloomy darkness? Now, that may not be as important in a text. It can be because we'll oftentimes talk about light. But you can really think about that when you're watching films as well, too. Like, how is something lit? Darkness typically is indicating some kind of uh, mystery, some kind of, I don't know, maybe even trying to scare you. Um, whereas bright light is all about kind of a sort of like a be, being able to see everything, kind of a clarity. A couple more. If your setting is outdoors, how is nature being portrayed? Is nature this like friendly, beautiful environment? Are you walking through the woods and there's bluebirds floating around and butterflies? Or is it a kind of a dark wood with, you know, moss hanging off of the trees and evil looking birds kind of making horrible noises, right? Is this a cultivated landscape? Meaning did humans go in and actually uh, tame it or is it wild? Um, are things dead or alive? Are we looking at big, open, wide expanses? Um, or are we looking at kind of like overgrown lushness, right? And if we're dealing with human environments where we're looking at things like buildings and uh, perhaps cityscapes or suburban buildings, how are they described? Are we having buildings that are described as cruel sentinels looking out on the world? Or are we talking about buildings that are just simply kind of passive and just there? Are they suggesting something that is a, a rich atmosphere? Are they suggesting perhaps one that is poor, that's squalid, for instance? Are things messy? Are they neat, right? What kind of furniture is in a room? What kind of decorations are in a room? All these can have a massive importance to how we actually are analyzing and understanding a story at the end of the day. Okay, so in addition to the Bless Me Ultima piece, I've got a little exercise that I want you guys to do, and that's to take five minutes or so and to watch these clips. Now, you can also just pick one of these clips if you want. So for instance, if you would just like to simply say, let's say pick Shawshank Redemption because you really like that movie, just click on the link and what you're going to see is about a three, four minute long clip from that movie. And what I would like you to do is I would like you to take a couple of minutes and to analyze what's going on here with the setting. Okay. And specifically what you're going to be asking in terms of the setting are questions, the questions that we actually had earlier, right? These ones here, is there any significance? Does the location suggest anything? All of these questions I'd like you to consider. And so I'll have them written out for you. And also to try to take your hand at trying to understand what that setting might be communicating. So what is it actually telling us? Okay. What are we, what are we feeling from this? What possibly might be thematically important about the setting? Now you might already know what the film is about. And so you're able to speak a little bit to that, but really here, just try to analyze what you're looking at. And so I would actually pick a film that maybe you've never seen before. 
There's a couple of classics on here. Singing in the Rain and It's a Wonderful Life and The Sound of Music are all films from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And so they've been around forever. Uh, they're the kinds of things that you see when you see like sort of movie compilations of famous scenes. But certainly The Martian, which is a fairly relatively new uh, film, as well as Jurassic Park and Shawshank Redemption are worth talking about as well, too. Simply pick one of these and find for me what you would like to say about those. And I'll include all of this information in uh, Schoology. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, remember that this presentation in terms of the actual presentation itself will be available to you. You can download it anytime that you want to. And I'm always available to answer any questions about it as well, too. So thank you.